Hi, everybody. Sorry, I was, thought I was broadcasting and I was not. <laughs> Welcome again <laughs> to everybody who's already online. I'm Kate, uh, Communications and Outreach Coordinator for the Natural Areas Association. Um, this is Management Considerations of Pollinating Bats on Wind and Solar Farms and Utility Right-of-Way Management and, uh, that supports pollinators and safe energy transmission. We're going to get started in just a minute. Um, but this is a really good opportunity for people to learn how to use the chat function. I've actually put up a question in the chat box already that I'd love for you guys to take a look at if you have a second. Um, usually I ask people where the people are logging in from, uh, but uh, I thought I'd mix it up a little bit and ask people today just very simply what it is that you hope to learn from today's, um, today's webinar. Um, we've had so, such a diverse group of people attend this series so far. Um, so we'd love to learn more about why you're here and what, what you're interested in, because we have one more webinar after this. So um, let me know through the chat function um, what your answer is to that question, if you have one. Um, hold on one second. I just realized that question might not be visible to everyone. There it is. Now it should be visible. Um, and also let me know if you have any trouble hearing or seeing me. That would be great. Oh, I see answers coming up already. That's awesome. Uh, Adam says he's interested in what impact solar could have on bats and using prairie plants with a solar array, which I think is probably going to be a pretty common question. Um, other people, what they're hoping to, to learn, I'd love to know. And while you guys are logging in, getting settled, and um, checking out the question, um, Wendy says, as a public land manager, I want to understand management practices available and what can be implemented. Yeah, that's kind of our sweet spot. That's what Natural Areas Association um, hopes to, to convey to people. We're very much all about that. Info on pollinating bats. Uh, Val, you're welcome. We love hosting these webinars. Um, Catawba Lands Conservancy, they have a number of utility rights of way that they want to learn more about how to manage. Engaging with utility companies and how to coordinate between them and private landowners, that's awesome. Yeah, getting all the stakeholders together. How wind turbines in my area are affecting bats from Oklahoma. Thank you, Mary Ruth. Um, Doug from Worthington, I used to work at Bank One, Doug, so I know exactly where you are. Um, all right. Great, thank you so much. We're gonna, we're gonna get started. I wanna make sure that we're keeping on time here. So yeah, welcome to Management Considerations of Pollinating Bats on Wind and Solar Farms and Utility Right-of-Way Management that supports pollinators and safe energy transmission. We wanna welcome Dave Waldine, affiliated scholar with the Christopher Newport University, who's gonna be presenting the first talk. Many of you may know him uh, through his work at Bat Conservation International as well. And Peter Beasley, Vegetation Program Manager and expert at PG&E, who's gonna be presenting the second talk today. We are so pleased and, and honored to have them here today. Um, let me share my screen. All right, can anyone see my screen? I'm having some trouble getting it up. Let's see what we can do about I, sharing it. I see it. Oh, you see it? Because I, oh, there we go. Now I can see it too. <laughs> Great. It's very windy here. I always blame the wind for techno technological problems. Um, just a quick word about this pollinator series. I mean, I think many of you who are on have probably um, attended some of the other ones. Um, we, in fact, we, we hope so. And there's one more after this. Today is April 4th, but um, April 18th, we're going to have the very last one. Um, we're, we really put this together with the help of a lot of other people, including Pollinator Partnership, the Bureau of Land Management, and uh, the US Forest Service, who gave us the support um, so that we are able to do this today. Um, we have seven talks. Uh, presented every other Wednesday. This is serving as a companion initiative to the NAA synthesis paper on pollinator health and resilience in natural areas management, which will be out later this year, so stay tuned for that. 
Uh, some of this information came out of a dynamite symposium at the Natural Areas Conference in 2017 in Fort Collins, Colorado, and we're really thankful that it did, and we are hoping to see more of that come out of our conferences. Um, so much happens at our conferences that we don't get a chance to share with everybody, so uh, more on that too. Um, our upcoming webinar is going to be Wednesday, April 18th, as I mentioned, and we are honored to have uh, Scott Hoffman Black, the Executive Director of Xerces Society, returning. He will be a two-timer uh, for us. He's presented last year as well for best management practices for pollinators, creating practices that are meaningful and implementable for rangelands. And we're also honored to have Jim Kane with us um, next time, the research ent entomologist in the USDA. Um, he's going to be taking on something that's a little... Uh, a little, um, he described it as a little controversial. So we'll see. Um, I hope to see you there. Please register if you haven't. Um, we do have a limited number of seats, even though we've raised the, the limit for these, um, for these webinars. Um, also, we actually have a, a regular a webinar for our regular series coming up in May. I really encourage you guys, if you have any interest in um, what can be done to um, restore natural areas, um, to, to take a look at it. It's going to be quite something. We're uh, going to have Mentor Marsh History, Tragedy, Recovery, Phragmites in a Natural, a National Natural Landmark, um, and our good friend uh, David Kriska from Cleveland Museum of Natural History will be presenting that. And it also serves as kind of a shout out for um, an upcoming uh, regional workshop that we're going to be having in July. Uh, the dates are there. Um, we're still working out the details, but um, you, anybody who attends is definitely going to get a lot more detail on the Mentor Marsh project, um, as well as some other th projects that are going on in um, north, I'm going to get this wrong, northwestern Pennsylvania, northeastern Ohio. There we go. I'm from there. You'd think I'd know. All right. Um, just a few things about um, kind of other resources that we have available for you. So webinars are obviously the NAA's continuing commitment to bring the latest and most relevant information to you guys, uh, both our members and the larger community of natural areas practitioners. Um, this series is free, and so far the access to the YouTube uh, archives, which we posted after, everyone always asks me, yes, I am posting the archives right after this, as soon as I can get it up. Um, we offer those free to, um, to everyone so far. If you're interested in pollinators, we have a special edition of the journal, Managing for Pollinators in Natural Areas. It's awesome. People have been ordering it uh, at a pretty steady clip uh, as a result of these um, webinars. So I encourage you to take a look at that on our website under our journal tab. And our conference, which I'm going to talk about more in a second, is going to feature programming on pollinators and natural areas management. We always have something on pollinators, but we're definitely going to be foregrounding it to a certain degree. Um, I'll make it quick. You guys already know us, hopefully. Um, we are the Natural Areas Association. We've been working to support the community of natural areas professionals for more than 40 years. We've been around a while. We're coming up on our 45th annual conference. Um, we are the only national nonprofit membership organization uh, dedicated to the support and advancement of the community of natural areas professionals. Um, that's our mission. That's our only mission. We are here for you. Uh, many of you already know us through our journal, which is peer-reviewed uh, for a quarterly publication for scientists and natural area professionals to share their research focused on land managers, um, as many of you are. Subscription to the journal comes with your membership. Uh, we hold the conference annually. Uh, this year it's in Bloomington, Indiana on October 23 to 25. You'll hear about more about that in a second. We recently debuted a brand new website and member portal. We're really excited about this. Um, if you remember, go take a look. There's a lot more that you haven't seen that it's all new. <laughs> and for those of you who are not members, these are just some of the tools that we're um, being able to and we're, we're privileged to be able to offer to our two members. Um, we invite you to become a member if you're not already. It's not expensive and we are so thrilled um, to have you and it's, it's an investment into this community as well as into your, your own uh, professional life. Uh, it's easy. Individual memberships start at $75 a year. Uh, that's the equivalent of about one fancy coffee per month. Not a lot. Um, and you get the journal, discounted access to the conference, and all of the other things on our website. Last but not least, Natural Areas Conference Call for Proposals is open. Those of you who are really um, who are into pollinators, obviously that's going to be the subject of some of our programming there. Please check it out on our website, uh, Natural Areas. Uh, dot org under conference. 
it's three days of symposia, oral sessions, poster presentations, social, it's the whole nine yards. Those of you who have attended know how great it is. Um, and we encourage everyone to attend uh, who's listening right now. I guarantee that you will enjoy it. Um, author Scott Russell Sanders is our opening plenary, and we should be able to announce some pretty great closing plenary speakers very, very soon. Last of all, I want to uh, thank our partner, the U.S. Forest Service, for their support of this series. We're so grateful. All right. And with that, um, I want to remind everybody this webinar is going to be available on our YouTube channel. You can find the link on our website, which is um, on many of these uh, slides. If it's processed in time, I'll add a link to the Zoom email. Please use the chat function to ask questions. Um, Peter and David have said that they will answer questions at the end of their respective um, uh, presentations. Um, so you know, just make sure they can see your questions as soon as they come up, but we're trying to, in the interest of time, save them till then. And if there are no more questions, we want to um, move it to Dave. Excellent. Well, thank you, Kate. I'm going to attempt to grab the screen. Yep, here we go. Excellent. And okay, you should be on a, a full screen view. Is that correct? That's right. Well, excellent. I appreciate the, everyone's time today. Uh, Kate, uh, thank you for inviting me. And uh, everyone, thank you for taking time out of your very busy days. I know everyone's days are very full. Um, uh, on any given day at this point in time, even on weekends. So um, it's a pleasure to be here. As Kate mentioned, I uh, was formerly with Bat Conservation International where I was very privileged to work with a number of folks who their primary purpose was looking at bats and wind energy uh, interactions and developing solutions. Um, you know, my task today is to give some maybe perspectives on management considerations for pollinating bats for wind farms as well as solar farms. I'm now with Christopher Newport University and, you know, I'll try and build upon the research that has been done while giving you maybe hopefully a broader context uh, from which to interpret uh, available information. So just a very, very brief background. Uh, there are over 1,380 species of bats around the world. Most of them are spread throughout the tropics, as you can see on this map in the, in the red areas. We have 47%, or 47 species in the United States and Canada, about 3% of the bats. And as pure pollinators, uh, we only have three within the United States. Uh, so bats come in a range of sizes, some of them as small as 15 centimeter wingspans and others up to 1.8 meters uh, of a wingspan. I'm privileged to work in the Philippines uh, where the largest bats in the world are uh, with over 1.8 meters. They happen to be a fruit eating and pollinating species. And the wingspan of those bats are greater than my Filipinos, the average Filipino height is. Uh, most bats are, uh, have one pup per year, and so uh, they are, once we lose populations, it's very hard for them to be recovered. And here in the U.S., most of our bats uh, eat insects, and there's been some wonderful research for, uh, from a number of folks and that suggests U.S. farmers uh, save over $3.1 billion a year in saved uh, in costs. Uh, but let's bring it back to the pollinating bats and, and what it means for us. You know, here in the, in a temperate, mostly a temperate country, uh, you know, the impacts of bats uh, are felt more indirectly than they are directly. So the uh, plants and, and, uh, and products that we import are where the bat benefits are really coming from. So for those of us who may like tequila. They come from pollinating bats, uh, which we do have here in the U.S. Uh, for those of you who may like durian from Southeast Asia, 
Uh, bats are a major pollinator. Bats also uh, pollinate banana and many other species of, of fruit uh, that you can see within this uh, slide. Uh, here's another description of uh, a visual representation of where our bats are here within the United States. And these are our three uh, pollinating bats. Two of them are endangered and one of them isn't listed. And the context for you as land managers to have when you're thinking about managing for, as, for bat pollinators, Keep in mind that the only bat pollinators that you have are within the south, very most southwest United States in the Big Bend area of Texas, the Boot Hill of New Mexico, and in southern Arizona. Uh, so very limited range distribution. So I'd like to try and answer or give you some context to think about managing those limited landscapes for pollinating bats. And hopefully what I'll give you is some broader insights for bats and wind farms and solar farms uh, in general, not just related to pollinating bats, but, it, but this is focused on pollinating bats. Um, but explicitly, the, the primary answer to the question is, you know, what do we know about bats and their interactions on uh, wind power and solar power? We really know next to nothing. I'm sorry, that's the take home message. Uh, but there are some things that we can learn. And we can learn this from over 12 years of research or 13, 14 years of research now uh, on that people have done research on bats and wind energy in particular, and uh, very little has been on, done on solar power. Uh, but I wanna share a few of those lessons learned uh, for, for us to consider here. So wind power really started its uh, development back in the early 2000s. And that's when the Bat Conservation International launched uh, a collaborative effort, uh, the Bats and Wind Energy uh, Cooperative. And over the last you know, 12, 14 years, there have been millions of dollars that have been invested in research on minimizing the understanding and minimizing the impact of wind power on, on bats. And it's like I said, it's only been in the last you know, 10 plus years. Um, the approach that in a broader sense that researchers have taken is one step within the mitigation hierarchy. You know, we have tended to focus our research efforts on how do we minimize the impact of wind power once the uh, turbines are, are installed because that's where we're seeing the dead animals. Uh, very little work has been done on the first step of the mitigation hierarchy, avoid the, the issue to begin with. Most of the work has been done on minimization and ex essentially nothing's been done on mitigation related to this. So some of the key lessons that we have learned uh, and this is a kind of a, a rough synthesis of this. There are many, many studies out there and the take home messages are that hundreds of thousands of predominantly insectivorous bats uh, within the United States are killed each year. Uh, given the challenges of this type of research, the specific numbers are highly variable, uh, but the core message is hundreds of thousands of uh, insect bats killed each year. Most of these tend to be the migratory tree bats, uh, the hoary bat, the red bat, the, the uh, silver-haired bat, and so on. However, more recently, and in part this is because we've started to look in other areas, we see larger proportions of species killed when you find uh, when you do the research at wind farms that are located near major congregations of, of bats. So at those large hibernacula or at those large maternity colonies. There's been some great research by a colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Winifred Frick and others that have shown through modeling that the hoary bat may be at risk of extinction uh, within the US predominantly because of the wind power issues. There's a number of other factors and you know, the take home message is that some additional research is needed, but 
uh, this is to emphasize the point that this is not just this uh, arbitrary argument that lots of bats are, are dying, which is true, but this may have very significant um, implications for uh, endangered species management over large landscapes. Um, to build upon that point that the wind farms can uh, start to kill, or you, we see greater deaths when wind farms are located near uh, larger colonies. Um, so another species that, that comes into greater proportions uh, of the mortality events are, is the little brown bat. And so when you place them near a major cave root, so a hibernacula within Wisconsin, for example, you see a large number or a greater number and a greater proportion of little brown bats dying at the wind farms. This is very important for additional consideration because the little brown bat is one of those species that is uh, heavily hit by white nose syndrome. So wind power this, and this research over the last uh, 12 years or so has created a great deal of information to inform management for insectivorous bats. They found that the curtailment um, of, of when they, they start to, when the wind turbines start to produce energy, uh, if you curtail them and they don't start producing until a higher rate of speed, um, you reduce mortality. With you feather the blades so that they're not spinning at lower wind speeds and you reduce mortality. If you combine, you know, variables like wind, uh, wind uh, speeds and temperature and other variables, this is called smart curtailment, you decrease mortality. There's research going on that is suggesting that in some cases and with some species, these deterrents can reduce mortalities because uh, mortality at wind farms at turbines because they repel the bats from there. One of the things that is really consistent though is there is a lot of variability because there are a lot of species that have a lot of different uh, habit, uh, excuse me, behaviors in these different landscapes. Some of the bats, you know, appear to be attracted to wind farms, others uh, and turbines. Um, you know, there's mixed results on so much of this. And so we're looking for some broader patterns and you know, there's not a single solution other than these, these are broad guidances that can, uh, or broad guidelines that can help minimize the impact, negative impacts of wind power. There are costs to doing business as well. Uh, I was at a conference, a back conference last week, uh, where they, the uh, uh, plenary session was focused on the you know, wind power and wind development and, and bats. And one of the, some of the key messages were that we need more research. And as I started this presentation, you, you know, there is virtually nothing on pollinators. We still need, after 10, 12, 14 years of research on insect bats, one of the strongest messages are that we need more research because there are major differences in the species that are being impacted. There's major regional differences. Uh, there's new technology on wind power. Uh, that's coming down the line that's going to allow it to operate at slower and or lower and lower wind speeds that will minimize and even negate some of these uh, minimization strategies that have shown to be promising. Will that translate into the loss of our minimization strategy and still um, result in dead bats? We don't know. Um, but one of the things that we continue to see though is that most of this research continues to focus on minimization. And when the people were asked, what are the lessons? What is the lesson that we have for us to apply to another country? We had colleagues from Mexico where there are lots of pollinating bats. Lessons learned from the insect bat and wind research here in the United States. What can they learn um, and apply it in Mexico? Well, the answer was, let's do more research. And I fully agree with that. And I'm fully in support of green energy and, and, uh, and wise informed management of, of energy development. But I think there, there are lessons beyond let's do more research because we have to have solutions and not 
research that leads to more research and leads to more research. And as land managers, I suspect you want tools that you can use and apply today, not wait for research that is always leading to more research and never to something that you can use. Um, so that's a very brief outline on what we think we know about bats and wind. But when we even come to solar, it's even worse. There's, there's essentially no information, uh, to my knowledge, uh, that on the impacts of solar power and wind because the research hasn't really started. Um, and so this is another major area where we do need research, whether it's on pollinating bats or insectivorous bats. So as a conservation biologist who is supportive of wind power and solar power and, and who is very much supportive of biodiversity conservation and finding a balance in everything that we do, I would propose to you that we really need to be precautionary in how we approach our management. None of us want to see these types of headlines. <clears throat> Excuse me. You know, when bats look for meals near wind power, bats die. Bat eagle deaths at wind farm prompt federal probe. Uh, that latter one is explicitly from Arizona, and it was talking about uh, you know one. I believe it was one pollinating bat, uh, the lesser long-nosed bat, an endangered species that was killed at a wind farm. Um, but I, I found this online as well, and you know, don't read. You don't. No need to bother with it. Oops, pardon me. No need to bother with the tech, reading the text. But this is a description that came out of a blog about a clean energy summit back in 2015, and this was about birds. You know, they, they people are calling them streamers because these bats are set afire as they fly over these uh, wind farms, and they're incinerated in flight. Now. Is this common? Is it um, you know widespread? Was this a one-off sort of event? Is this uh, you know extravagant uh, and use of uh, uh, extreme language to make a point? I don't know, but the point is we don't want these types of headlines uh, when we're dealing with endangered species and management of, of very important natural resources within your purview. So again, I would come back as a precautionary principle and use the mitigation hierarchy. Let's work through the entire process to help minimize and effectively manage our natural resources and the needs for solar power and wind power. Uh, this message that siting doesn't work, which is one of the key messages that came from uh, the meeting last year, uh, last week. Well, I would argue uh, against this statement. I don't believe that it is true in a broader context. They were talking about the use of um, bat detectors to predict, uh, to measure levels of bat activity, to predict levels of mortality. Yes, that research didn't work. But I do suggest that this statement isn't broadly applicable when you put, at it, put it in context. And here's the reason why. Uh, so this is up here, we have Bracken Bat Cave. This is the world's largest colony of the Mexican free tail bat, which has been hit by wind farms, or you know, they, they not this colony, um, but free tail bats are killed by, at wind farms. And there's around 10 million plus or minus, who knows how many uh, bats here, but if you put wind farms or if you put a solar farm you know in the nearby vicinity whatever that nearby means you cannot undo that you cannot remove those wind farms in the immediate future and if there is a problem then you have a major problem that you uh, the best you can do is to minimize the impact so let's avoid some of these let's have that first step of the mitigation heart uh, hierarchy implement it because the location does mean something. Uh, in the lower right, uh, just in northern Mexico, uh, just below Arizona, is Pinacate, where there's, I believe, uh, over 100,000 um, lesser long-nosed bats, and it's a major, major maternity colony, and the, these bats do fly up into um, Arizona. Again, if you put wind farms near these major roost sites, 
you know, whether there is a risk of impact. We don't know right now if the bats, uh, pollinating bats, will be killed in large numbers at wind farms. But when we're dealing with endangered species, and we're, when we're dealing with management that may not be easily changed, then we should take that precautionary principle and try to avoid the potential for impact to begin with. Because if once the impact's there, the best we can do is minimize it. And even with the best that we can do on wind power right now is to minimize uh, you know, mortality in some cases, maybe 50% or so. Again, very, those numbers are very uh, 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 highly variable where, depending on where you're at. This one is harder. You know, if, if the wind farms aren't there and there isn't, uh, or a solar farm isn't presented uh, on a landscape yet, but there's habitat that may attract large numbers of bats. So uh, cactus or, or agave fields where the bats may come in and and uh, uh, forage. You know, should we put a, a wind farm or a solar farm there? I would propose, even though the data are not very, uh, not readily available at this point in time, you may want to consider avoiding these sorts of uh, situations or go into it knowing that these may be areas where bats do congregate. Again, the research isn't there yet to suggest one way or the other. A precautionary principle is if you think there's going to be conflict, large numbers of bats, uh, you may not want to build that wind farm or solar farm there to minimize that potential conflict. Um, once those wind farms are in place or the solar farms, you may want to consider removing some of the vegetation that may attract pollinating bats. So the agaves or the cacti that they come in and forage on. Again, the research isn't there for the pollinating bats. The, with the insect bats, in some cases, we're seeing the attraction of bats to the wind farms. There are places where uh, there's no evidence that even water sites that have insects available and water for foraging, that these attract uh, these bats uh, into the wind farms as well. So this is, um, these are just general guidance once these farms are in place and the additional research is really needed on the pollinating bats in particular. Um, and even though I'm talking about the pollinating bats, I would encourage managers to consider implementing the guidance from this 12 plus years of research on insectivorous bats. Curtailment, feathering the blades, the smart curtailment, the, re uh, the deterrent research and the other types of research that's needed. So even though this stuff is applicable, mostly applicable to the insectivorous bats throughout the United States, even though we're talking about the pollinating bats, you're still having a positive impact for your insectivorous bats. So we still need all of this stuff for the pollinating bats. We need this for insect bats, we need this for the pollinating bats. But this mitigation hierarchy, I think, provides us with the framework to minimize the negative impacts of a lot of uh, the, the wind and solar management and to free up industry and to give the guidance to the management organizations to uh, maximize the benefit for everything considered. But we must look at the avoidance and the minimization and the mitigation, not just the minimization, because you know, once the development is in place, and if it's near major concentrations of bats, there's no one ringing that bell. You know, if there's going to be a problem, you may not be able to undo it without major, major financial costs or the major loss uh, to endangered species or maybe even resulting in the creation of, of an endangered species. So with that, I'd like to open it up for questions. Remember everybody, you can submit questions for Dave through the webinar chat function and he'll be able to see them.
Anybody have any questions for Dave before we move on to Peter? I think there's, I mean, obviously there's a lot to digest. Um, oh, Charlotte's got one and Chris as well. Well, uh, that's, thank you, Charlotte. Um, so regarding solar farms and bats, you know, that, that is a really, really good question. Um, you know, would bats be negatively impacted, pollinating bats or insect bats, uh, at these uh, solar farms? You know, I don't know. The, you know, the, the risk of extreme temperatures over the solar farms, you know, the temperatures probably go down. Uh, so you may not have those immediate impacts, uh, but this is an area that needs a lot of research. Um, you may see uh, indirect impacts, impacts, changes in behaviors, changes in how bats move within a landscape. Um, uh, so you may see in those indirect benefits or uh, impacts one way or the other, whether or not they kill the individual bats or not. Um, Let's see. Oh, feathering a blade. Sorry, I'm going to try and catch up here. Uh, feathering a blade is turning it so that they don't grab the wind uh, at slow speeds and they don't, don't start turning the blades. Uh, and then at some point, they kick into energy production. And that's if you feather the blades, it, it slows it down or stops. they stop turning at low winds. And then if you curtail it, that's when they uh, and start them spinning at a, at a higher wind speed. Uh, that'll minimize the time that the blades are turning when bats are most often active. Um, let's see. So, let's see. So, can anyway, I, so can I just uh, cut in here real quickly? Please. It seems that people are submitting their questions and they're submitting them to just the panelists. Oh, um, yes. And everybody wants to see them. So if you uh, if you look at your chat box, like it'll give you an option of, of who it's to. Um, yeah, Heather's got it. <laughs> All panelists and attendees is what you're looking for. Um, if you haven't had your, your question asked, if, actually, even if you've had your question asked, could you restate it so that everyone can see it? Because that would be, I think that would be really great uh, for everyone here because we're, we're hearing Dave answer questions we can't see. Yeah. Okay, so uh, let, me, let me catch up with, since there were, rolling through. Are the corporate wind farms cooperating with environmental groups to access and compile the data? Uh, there's another group, uh, the American Wind Energy, or excuse me, the American Wind and Wildlife Institute that is working with a, a lot of the wind companies to collate data into a database. Uh, a lot of this is very sensitive information and they have uh, constraints on how the information is shared and summarized. So there is a level of that that is going on, uh, which is a, a good starting point. Um, and you know, there there are some voluntary guidelines that uh, at least 17 wind companies have adopted. These are voluntary guidelines put out by the American Wind and or Wind Energy Association. Uh, that was based in large part off of the. Um, the research of the B, BWAC, uh, Bats and Wind Energy Cooperative, and many others. So those guidelines are, are, are maybe not as stringent as one would like from a bat protection end of things, but they're a nice start. Uh, we don't know how many of the, uh, of the actual wind farms are actually implementing these, and therefore it's hard to track if there's a positive impact of this. Um, let me see, auditory deterrence. Uh, yes, um, there are several, well, I don't know about several. I know of at least two groups, General Electric, I believe, is working on some uh, uh, auditory deterrence as well as Bats and Wind Energy Cooperative. Um, you know, they have a lot of challenges with the uh, perfecting the techniques. They've made some, uh, some great progress over the last few years, but one of the challenges that they do have is uh, those auditory deterrents and having the signal travel far enough to have that positive impact or in repelling bats. So there's a lot of work 
still going on to evaluate if auditory deterrence will work. And, and there may be some uh, big species differences as well on that front. Um, here's a question on white nose syndrome. Uh, so white nose syndrome, to the best of my knowledge, is not in Arizona, New, Me New Mexico, or Colorado at this point in time. Uh, it's in the eastern United States, Canada, and it's made it into Washington State in the West. Um, that, my personal view, uh, even though that there's not, you know, explicit data, that was a human-induced movement uh, of the fungus. Uh, and there's been additional um, detections of white nose syndrome. There's a lot of monitoring that is underway throughout the Western United States so that we can have early detections. There is some research that is starting to show some promise to be able to um, mitigate or minimize the impact, uh, whether or not it'll be that silver bullet uh, that we can apply uh, throughout the, the, the impact zone of WNS, you know, we're not sure. But uh, it's, it's really great to know that there is some research that is showing some promise um, because it is driving a lot of our management consideration for bats. And, and again, when we're thinking about large numbers of bats, over half of them in the United States, um, you know, around 25 species have the potential to be negatively impacted from WNS. Uh, you know, we don't think the pollinating bats will be because they don't hibernate but uh, perhaps they could move the fungus into other areas where other species pick it up and move it into zones where WNS uh, can be impacted or manifest. So. Um, let me see. Are there other questions that I'm kind of asking here? Kate, did you see any other questions? Yeah, already? Scott Hagen asked, um, how far away from hibernacula do wind farms need to be, or did you answer that one? Uh, no, I, I didn't answer that. And, and that's an excellent question. Uh, and this is one of those areas that the scientists and the, and the researchers really tie themselves in knots. You know, the only way to really look at that, because we do have cases where or excuse me, it, it may be one of those questions that are, is nearly impossible to look at and get really solid information because of the variabilities that we see. You know, we know that some bats are attracted to wind farms. Um, but how do you evaluate the impact of, of, of wind farm? How close do you get it? It's not like you can move these wind farms and test the differences in distances from a, a given situation. So it's it's a really tough question, and you know it's this is where you come back to the precautionary Dave, are you still there? Because I'm not hearing approach. you. You know, down in Texas, uh, there's you know a oh, dozen. What's that? Sorry, I think we had a little bit of a bobble, and I wasn't hearing you, but I can hear you now. Okay, yeah, down in Texas, there's a like a dozen you know you know million bat colonies of free tail bats or so. Oops, did you lose me? We have a storm coming through here. I can hear you, can you hear me? Yeah, sorry guys, that was me. <laughs> okay. Uh, so yeah, just, just to end it here maybe and allow Peter to take over and he'll have much better data I, I suspect. You, you know, there's, it, it's, in my view, as a conservation biologist, you know, we're, we're never going to have that absolute, you know, 2.5 miles to 5 miles to 10 miles or whatever it is. Um, you know, we're going to have to make some judgment calls. And, you know, that, that will not negate the potential impact, but we are trying to minimize the risk of significant impact. And so hopefully um, that as People are looking at where are the next round of development? Where is that next round going in? 
uh, that they consider the potential for impact of these uh, major concentrations of bats and, and take more of a precautionary approach on avoiding potential impact rather than betting all the money uh, and investment on minimizing potential impact afterwards. That's great. I wanted to call attention that Forrest Schomer, uh, this is more, not a question, but um, has posted uh, some information that people might want to take a look at in the comments as well as we go through. Um, Dave, thank you so much. Pete, Peter has already um, kind of jumped on top of this and he is ready to go. So with that, we're going to turn over um, this presentation to Peter Beasley from PG&E right now. So thanks very much. Go ahead, Peter. Thanks, Kate, and thanks, Dave. Uh, a very interesting duff, uh, stuff, Dave, uh, particularly as an energy company that purchases uh, wind and solar. And what we recognize is that all of these different energy uh, producing uh, and energy movement systems that there can be impacts. Um, so to transition into what I'm going to be speaking about today, which is a utility right-of-way management that supports pollinators and uh, safe energy transmission. Um, take a look at this image here, um, and I'll come back to it a little bit later, but let me uh, give you a little bit of an overview of the presentation. Um, what we're really trying to look at is what the habitat potential might be for energy corridors, particularly electric transmission energy corridors or gas transmission corridors. Um, and then what are the best practices that the utility industry and others have developed to support our primary goal, which is safe and reliable power? Uh, but how can that be done to support other resource management goals? Uh, in our case, what we're looking to do is address incompatible vegetation that might pose a risk to, fac to facilities. And in doing so, what sorts of desired plant communities might we be able to achieve to support those goals and other goals such as habitat? So I'll be talking about some of the partners that we have here in California. I, I did send out a little text note to see if we actually have any pg e customers and if so if there's any uh, land managers that might have some of our larger transmission facilities crossing it i'd be interested in seeing who you are um, my presentation will touch upon uh, our research and the linkages to the federal pollinator health strategy um, and again, we've been involved with uh, different research projects and field studies over the past, oh, five or so, six years, a little bit longer, and so I wanna share some of those results. But I'll also give some background about some other things going, going on uh, across the nation. So, uh, you know, just so you know who PG&E is and where we're at and what our footprint looks like, um, it's, it's a significantly large footprint, about 70,000 square miles across northern and central California. And what I'm going to be focusing on today is, is this extensive network of electric transmission uh, line corridors. Uh, in our case, nearly 18, a little over 18,000 uh, circuit miles. Uh, but we also have 6,700 miles of gas transmission pipeline facilities that we're managing in a similar fashion when it comes to uh, looking at what's compatible vegetation and what isn't. So again, I want to mention that you know our, our primary responsibility is to provide safe and reliable gas and electric service. And there are uh, a crisscrossing network of uh, facility types uh, where really that landscape, the intended use of that landscape is to safely and reliably either transmit electricity or transmit, transmit uh, pardon me, Yes, move gas, <laughs> natural gas to our customers. And we want to do that in a, a sustainable way. We have a very large footprint, uh, not only because of the lands we own, but the lands that we encumber and cross. Uh, and we've got a very diverse set of customers and community types, uh, including in California, a huge agricultural uh, community, a uh, significant amount of our economy in, in California is associated with agriculture, and clearly many of those uh, growers, um, farmers rely on the ecological services that pollinators provide. 
And so what we're, what we're trying to show today is that there are best management practices that support these uh, multiple goal, goals. Uh, so what are some of these best practices? I want to focus on uh, integrated vegetation management. And this is a, uh, it, it's based on uh, kind of a integrated pest management principles. Um, and really what we have is a set of laws and regulations that we're responsible for meeting and other commitments beyond just the laws and regulations. Uh, we, have, we have regulations that relate to vegetation clearances from our high voltage power lines, other laws and regulations that relate to our being able to access and in inspect our facilities to make sure they're safe. And what we're starting to see is an increasing concern about the uh, of fuels and fire risks and some new regulations related to that. And with a uh, change in climate and the drought that we've been experiences, experiencing out here in California, this has become a growing and uh, forgive the pun, a very hot topic. And so we're also working with uh, some industry experts, uh, in particular the Utility Arborist Association and the uh, International Society of Arboriculture um, to implement IVM best practices, um, also supported by the American National Standard Institute. And importantly, the industry has developed a right-of-way stewardship program to try to support excellence in implementing an integrated veg management approach. And so what am I talking about? Uh, basically, it's an ongoing process of trying to uh, establish some sort of a control of an unwanted pest or in our case, incompatible vegetation. So through this process that continues year after year or, or whenever uh, you decide you need to take action, you're setting your objectives, you're evaluating your site, you're determining when you need to take action, you evaluate what is the most effective control from a cost effectiveness, but also from an environmental sensitivity perspective. You go ahead and implement your controls, then you assess your controls, and you determine are they working, can they be changed, should they be changed because of changing conditions. And typically the utilities are using manual mechanical and chemical approaches, uh, but we also occasionally use a biological approach like using uh, a livestock grazing. And then the fifth method is a, is a cultural method, um, and that's where you're looking to maybe really change the landscape that's underneath uh, a right-of-way by changing its use. So if a, if a park is built in there, it's uh, an example of a cultural uh, change or replanting, uh, completely replanting for some other sorts of maybe a, a row crop or something like that. So that's kind of IVM in a nutshell. And what we're trying to achieve is this uh, management style called wire zone, border zone management. And it's the best practice for helping to reduce outages, uh, improve access, uh, lower costs over time and address other topics that might be important to you, which in our case in the West is fire and fuel loading. And the idea is that within the wire zone, as you can see here, and slightly extending out anywhere from 10 to 20 feet, depending on the voltage, what we're trying to do is really create an open early serial habitat, uh, a, a greater dominance of grasses and forbs and low growing shrubs. And then as you move out into the border zone, you can start to um, manage for taller shrubs, short statured trees, um, and it creates that uh, a mix of vegetation types. And this has been recognized uh, by the Pollinator Partnership as a management style that can cr create the types of habitat that could benefit poll pollinators. So let's take a look at a couple images on the uh, PG&E right away. One second, I'll need a little sip of water. Um, so on the left, this is private property that is immediately adjacent to the El Dorado National Forest. And what PG&E has done is we've removed the uh, tall conifers that were underneath the lines, and we've significantly reduced the amount of heavy brush that was in there. So the, the approach was to uh, cut trees, masticate the brush, follow up with selective herbicides, and what we're trying to do is establish a plant community that can be stable and help to restrict the regrowth of some of that other incompatible vegetation. 
Uh, and what we're finding in this location is, is we're actually getting some uh, regrowth and new occurrences of a federally protected plant called Lane's Butterweed, which most likely was shaded out uh, with the heavy stands of brush and trees uh, that's no longer there. On the right is a picture of a uh, right away that we're managing on the Plumas National Forest. Uh, we've been doing a lot of hand cutting, but uh, three years ago we uh, secured an, author an authorization to use herbicides, and so we're using uh, selective herbicides uh, to help manage that right of way. And as you can see, there's kind of a border zone, the wire zone, a border zone, and you can have start having taller trees that are uh, farther away from the lines. Um, and so if we can get more of this monkey flower and other grasses and forbs established, it'll help re uh, reduce the amount of work that we have to do in the future. So when I talk about selective herbicides, what am I talking about? Um, not only am I describing the chemistry of a, of a specific herbicide and how it can be selectively used, um, some of them might target a broadleaf plants, some of them may have some sort of soil activity that helps restrict the regrow, uh, rege, uh, germination. But I'm also talking about the approaches that we take and being selective with that. Uh, most of the work that we do is with a backpack sprayer where we're looking at very uh, small amounts of herbicides being directed right at specific plants, either through a cut stump treatment, uh, 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 directed foliar spray, basal stem spray, uh, and others. And so see, these are some of the herbicides that we use um, and we currently have approved on several forests out here in California. These are some examples of comparing a non-selective approach with a, with a more selective approach. And this is work done by Rick Johnstone and IBM Partners out east in partnership with Baltimore Gas and Electric and some federal landowners. Um, so what you see on the left is uh, just mowing alone. And so oftentimes utilities will just mow on a three to five year cycle. On the right, they've been able to implement mowing and then follow up selective use of herbicides. And so you can start to create that low growing plant community and start to get more diversity in there. And uh, just a, a better mix of plants that reduce the amount of work that needs to be done in the future. And clearly is starting to convert the vegetation type to have uh, more, more grasses and forbs. These are some images from a gas pipeline right of way and also along the highway. So if you're just continually mow every three to five years, you're really not changing the plant community. So how does this link to the federal strategy to promote health of honeybees and other pollinators? What this uh, effort uh, is focusing on kicked off by the Obama administration is to ask all the federal agencies to figure out what sort of strategies they can take to help improve the health of pollinators. And what we see is a significant uh, area of landscape associated with rights of ways, whether that be roads, gas pipeline rights of ways, electric transmission corridors or others. And so there's an extensive network um, that improves uh, that which, which they see as an opportunity to support habitat connectivity and just the sheer extensive amount of it. And in particular, it's interesting to note that the uh, pathway for migration for the monarch actually uh, aligns quite well with many of the uh, gas and electric and other uh, highway rights of ways that run uh, up to the, uh, let's see, to the Mideast and down into Mexico. And so there's a lot of effort of looking at what, what might we be able to do in those rights of way corridors. And specifically what the federal strategy is asking uh, the right of way manager are is, what are the best practices for supporting pollinators on rights of way and other managed areas? What plants are suitable for both pollination and any management constraint that you may have? And how do pesticide and herbicide applications affect pollinators? and their habitats. And so we've been engaged with this effort right from the beginning. In fact, we were invited to come out to try to encourage the Obama administration to take action. And so we've been doing that. Um, would like to point you to some of the longest running research on this topic that, uh, that, that I'm aware of. It's nearly 60 years plus now of ecological research on the Pennsylvania electric transmission rights of ways. And what they've been able to do is demonstrate that plant communities can be selectively managed 
to support reliable electric service and a diverse plant community for wildlife habitat. And this started with Dr. Bramble and Burns, you know, 60 plus years ago, was carried on by Dr. Yonner, and currently being done, uh, carried on with uh, Dr. Carolyn Mayhand. And she's really doing some excellent, excellent work. So I encourage you to take a look at their transmission line ecology website and look at the different research studies. Many of the plots and different, the, the different plots that they have have been established and managed the same way for 60 plus years. And so they're doing a lot of different research on all kinds of different wildlife species. So let's jump into our first field study. This was a, a uh, a, a partnership project in the American River Parkway in Sacramento, California, um, a, a very extensive landscape. Uh, and so we, uh, there's a multiple utilities that have electric transmission facilities in the uh, parkway, including our friends at the Sacramento Municipal Utility District. So we've been working with the Pollinator Partnership and Sacramento County to try to address multiple resource uh, conservation and other needs. Uh, in the parkway, there's a lot of human use. We have uh, a, a very extensive amounts of non-native invasive plants, and there are a lot of human-caused fires off right-of-way that have burned into the right-of-way and have damaged facilities, either burning a pole or actually creating enough smoke than the particulate matter in it that can cause the lines to relay and trip. And so these are, you know, when these lines go out, there's a potential for a significant impact across the nation. Uh, potentially in California and beyond since we have an interconnected grid. So we've been working to understand how our management of the right-of-way might be able to support additional uh, goals, including the, re the re reducing the risk of, 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 of catastrophic wildfire, and also working with the parks resource specialist to try to improve uh, and enhance native plant habitat. So what we did is we compared to two different IVM techniques. We compared standard mowing alone compared to mowing and the use of selective herbicides. Uh, and so we had different treatments uh, distributed throughout the parkway and we uh, took data um, from 2012 through 2015. And what it was was a bee sampling pr protocol provided and supported by the pollinator partnership where you do activity sampling, sampling uh, visiting bees using a standard visual, visual observation protocol. And then we also set up a passive sampling approach where uh, we established nest boxes in the, in the two different treatment areas to, to see if there may be uh, solitary uh, bee nesting and what the differences might be in the two different uh, uh, landscapes. So let's jump into some of the data. On the bee nesting trends, we generally had more bees nesting at the sites where we had selective herbicide. It was about 20% higher. But when you look at the statistical significance, there really was not a difference. Part of the challenge here, though, is that we had very low nesting numbers, which apparently is common with the sampling method. And in this case, there's a significant amount of habitats available to pollinators, and so they may just not have used the nesting boxes as much as uh, we thought. But on the floral visitation observations, what we saw was is, uh, when, we when we looked at the native bee use of the mowed and treated compared to the mowing alone treatments, we had more bees and more bee types seen in the selective herbicide landscapes. And so what we're noticing is, is not only a greater uh, abundance of uh, native pollinators using the selective herbicide site, uh, but also uh, an increase in diversity and richness. So that's what this showing over here. The honeybees we noticed tended to use the uh, mowed areas alone. Those areas are predominantly uh, covered with large stands of yellow star thistle, poisonous hemlock, and mustard. And so what happens is you've got this huge amount of floral resources that have, you know, apparently the honeybees can't resist. It's easy for them to get to that. Um, but if you just continue to mow and mow alone in that site, you're really not gonna get the type conversion to of a more, you know, maybe a more diverse and maybe a more native plant community. So 
there was a slight difference, but apparently not statistically different. I want to move on now to the next phase of our research, which is a partnership with Sonoma State University, and in particular what they call their Nature Tech Collaborative. What Sonoma State is doing is, is using their uh, research preserves and they're pairing that with you know, classroom education. And what they're determining is, is when you pair that classroom education with an outdoor learning experience and research, it's just a, uh, they're preparing students in a, in a much better and more comprehensive way. And so we donated funding and also high quality LIDAR data to support multiple research projects. Um, but I only have time to really focus on the pollinator research. Uh, and then in this case, what we're looking at is, is trying to better understand the potential of that managed right of way um, to support pollinator populations. And so what we did is a, a comparative study uh, looking at the pollinator interactions within the managed right of way. That right of way has been being managed by hand cutting and selective use of treatment, uh, herbicide treatments for several years. And what we did is we compared the floral visitation use between the right of way and compared that to an adjacent unmanaged and closed oak woodland canopy, along with a comparison to an adjacent uh, unmanaged open meadow. And this was on the Fairfield Osborne Preserve uh, from 2015 and 2017. And we're just now going through some of the analysis of the last year of data, and I'll be able to touch upon some of that. And again, what we're looking at is, is what's the potential differences between bee richness and abundance data by, by observing the floral use. So here's a little bit of an overview of the survey design. We established different quadrats within the, in, within the three different landscapes uh, and did observations. Within those quadrats, we documented all of the floral resources within the quadrats. And then what we did is we observed the interaction with the pollinators. And so if a pollinator landed on a certain plant, that was documented. And so we did this over three years uh, across these three different areas. And so to give you a little bit of sense of what these uh, uh, landscapes look like, um, on the right is the unmanaged open meadow. Uh, on the center is the unmanaged oak woodland canopy. And then on the right is a, a portion of the managed right of way. In this image here, it, you know, it looks very similar to the open meadow, but we do also have some shaded cover and other types of kind of uh, habitat in there. We've got some really high lines and conductors in, in some areas, and so we were able to keep some of the trees and taller brush species. So the right of way has kind of a, a, a mixed uh, uh, types of vegetation in it. So let's jump into the data. So what we noticed was uh, when we looked at the total floral resources and the bee vegetation per these standard five minute observations, when you look at the total use, bee visitation per site, including categories for native bees combined and a total for all bees is greatest in the right of way. So that's over here on the right you know, 500 or so uh, floral visit observations compared to 400. When we look at comparing native bees uh, and their use, uh, what we see is a slightly higher use in the open unmanaged meadow. Uh, but what you'll see in a later slide is that was not statistically different. These slides kind of uh, repeat some of the data, but it allows us to look at the st statistical significance when we're comparing the different landscapes. In this case, we're looking at the unmanaged open meadow and with the right of way. And what we're seeing is, is with the mean bee occurrence for these standard five minute observations, that there is a significant difference in the total use within the right of way. Here's the comparison with the enclosed woodland. And, and at first I thought, well, it's probably because the enclosed woodland has a lot more shade, maybe less floral resources. And what I learned from the students and researchers involved is that actually, actually wasn't the case. There's different vegetation, floral resources, pardon me, different floral resources within the enclosed woodland canopy. And they were described to me as potentially smaller flowers, so potentially less showy. And so maybe they're just not as attractive to the pollinators. 
the honeybee visitation was significantly higher in the right of way uh, compared to the open meadow. Um, I have some suspicions about what that might be. Uh, we haven't completed all the analysis on the vegetation types, but um, I thought this was interesting. Again, when we look at the native bee visitation, when we compare the open meadow to the right of way, there is a slightly higher uh, mean average for those occurrences. But if you if you look at the st statistics and the t tests that were involved, it appears they were not significantly different. I think this is particularly interesting. Interesting. We had a total of eight bee families observed across the three different landscapes. And what we found is, is that all eight families were observed in the right of way, seven out of eight were observed in the open meadow, and six out of eight were observed in the enclosed woodland canopy. As I mentioned, we're, we're still diving into some of the uh, data and, and uh, need to, con to, to do more analysis on the vegetation types and across the different types of vegetation across the three different landscapes. But here's some fine, you know, summary of findings and recommendations. Uh, more bees and more bee types are using the right of way when you compare to the other landscapes. Honey bee use was significantly higher in the other landscapes. Native bee use was highest in the unmanaged open meadow, but it appears the difference was not significant. And as I mentioned, additional analysis is needed to better understand the potential differences in floral resources across the different landscapes. Um, it, from what we've been able to uh, look at so far, the data, data does show a similar amount of floral resources across the different landscapes, but potentially different mixes. And in the right of way, what we found is, is there's a greater uh, occurrences of plants in their Asteraceae family when you compare it to the open meadow. Uh, as, as stated before in the earlier presentation, more research is needed, particularly in the West. There's a lot going on out East. Um, and we have actually provided funding to the Utility Arborist Association and the Tree Fund. And if there's any other utility in the West that wants to get involved with pollinator research or any sorts of other IV IBM comparative research, there may be grant funding available to you. Uh, I would like to point folks to, uh, you, can, you'll, you can learn more about this research. Um, at the upcoming 12th International Symposium on Environmental Concerns and Rights of Way Management in Denver, Colorado in September. And for any land manager that has utility infrastructure and corridors across your landscape, this conference is an amazing conference to learn about what some of the environmental concerns are and what the utilities and the utility partners are doing. So what's next for more research on our end? We're actually expanding the research that we've been doing. Um, the uh, Fairfield Osborne Preserve is in Sonoma County, just north of Santa Rosa, or actually, actually pardon me, south of Santa Rosa. Um, and we're expanding the research to the El Dorado National Forest, which is in the Sierra Nevada Mountains, and also on Pepperwood Preserve, which is farther north in Sonoma County. And we're gonna do similar types of uh, 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 ana uh, pardon me, uh, research and analysis. We'll be looking at, again, a managed right-of-way compared to the unmanaged canopy and the unmanaged meadow. But the other thing that we're going to be doing is, is starting to compare the differences between a, uh, a location that we will just continue to use a mechanical and a manual approach compared to a manual and a mechanical, uh, pardon me, a manual mechanical and herbicide approach. I want to say thanks to our partners, in particular, our friends at the Pollinator Partnership, Kelly Rourke, Senior Program Manager, who spoke earlier on the webinar series and has been very helpful in uh, helping analyze the data and help me with these graphs. Thank you, Kelly. And then Dr. Vicki Vojic, their Research Director, who really helped kick this off in partnership with PG&E and Sonoma State. And I'd also like to thank uh, Carrie Winninger, uh, a graduate student at Sonoma State University who really kicked this off and helped support all of the student interns, along with Dr. Christopher, Christopher Hawley from Sonoma State University and all of their student interns. Um, and then finally, I would like to thank the Natural Areas Association for letting me participate. And I also want to thank the U.S. Forest Service for helping sponsor this event. Uh, this is me with a handful of honeybees 
with one of our beekeepers that we allow to use our PG&E property. And so they were kind enough to show me their observation and how cool that was to have a handful of bees and not be freaking out. Anyways, hopefully I can get to some of your questions, but you can feel free to contact me for more information at the email listed there. So let's see. Questions. Like your first questions from Ellery Troyer, Peter, about the number of bees on mode versus selective herbicide sites. Let me see. Let me see if I can scroll up. Sorry, can you repeat it? Sure, yeah, I'll just repeat it. Yeah. Um, this okay. is from Ellery Troyer, and Ellery asks, were the number of bees on the mode versus selective herbicide sites averaged over the four years? Was there a difference between the last year before mowing on bee visitations and the first year? Let's see, if I, if I understand correctly, they were averaged across all years. Uh, not each year, we don't, we don't necessarily mow each year. Um, the corridor also includes SMUD uh, utilities and Western Area Power Authority utilities. And so we're all managing uh, at different times. Um, but if you want to send me an email with, uh, with that question, I may be able to dig into it further uh, and follow up with some of the folks that helped me take the data and follow up with the other utility. Awesome. Do you want me to read Forrest's question as well? Sure. Sure. So, um, and Forrest has a, a, a really timely question. Since your protocol calls for glyphosate use, and the state of California has a recent ban on that substance that's in court in San Francisco. What would be PAG&E's alternative protocol if that ban is upheld? Well, I, I, would, I would like to correct um, the statement about a ban. There is not a ban on glyphosate. What is happening is, is California has chosen to add glyphosate to our Prop 65 list. And the Proposition 65 list is a as an effort by California to uh, alert folks, whether they may be in a facility or around something that may have the potential to cause cancer. And there's quite a bit of controversy over this um, topic. And as I understand it, you know, clearly the manufacturer of that product doesn't feel that those are uh, correct um, that the analysis and the research there supports that. There's other researchers who say that, say that there is, but there's a significant amount of controversy over that. And as I understand it, um, there's really questioning whether it is a cancer causing agent or not. So we, if we follow uh, EPA regulations and California Department of Pesticide regulations, and currently glyphosate is a uh, registered and uh, product that can be used. Awesome. Um, the next question is from Jessica, and she said, you mentioned, Peter, uh, that the results for bees in rights of way versus unmanaged meadow was insignificant. Wasn't the p-value quite low indicating significance? Kind Let of a technical question. Yeah, let's see if I can go back up. And here's where I might need help from my my researcher experts. So, is, is this the slide we think we're looking at? Um, so, let's see, where's one more time on the question, if you don't mind. Yeah, Jessica says, you mentioned that the results for bees in rights of way versus unmanaged meadows was insignificant. Wasn't the p-value quite low indicating significance? I, this might okay. be referring to an earlier Okay. Yeah, uh, that's, I'll probably need to get some help from my experts. Um, again, feel free to send me an email at pmb7 uh, at pge.com. Uh, this was the slide where it appeared that there was a uh, slight difference in the mean B occurrence per standard five minute evaluation. And as I understand the statistics, if these bars are overlapping, then there may not be a, st a statistically difference. But yeah, this p-value is maybe what we're looking at. So if you don't mind, send me 
that question and I will get help from the experts that are supporting the guy that manages the contracts and all that stuff. <laughs> all right, cool. Um, we've got a ton more questions, but I, we're, we're, we'll have at least a few more. From Tara, she asks, for herbicide treatment, do you target only non-flowering, non-native plants? No, we, we because uh, I want to give a def I got maybe a clearer definition of incompatible vegetation. So incompatible vegetation could be native or non-native vegetation that poses a risk to the utility facilities. So a eucalyptus tree growing underneath the transmission power lines is a non-native, at least here in California, um, which we, if it was growing underneath the power lines or too close to the side, we would cut that and ideally be able to treat that to prevent resprouting. Um, a broadleaf maple, native maple tree, also growing underneath the power lines or immediately adjacent to it, um, incompatible with the intended use of that right of way. Ideally, we would we would cut and treat that. Um, so. When we talk about incompatibility, it's mostly from the standpoint of, is it creating a risk to the overhead power lines? Is it potentially creating a, a, a risk to our towers, our poles? Does it restrict our access? Or could it be um, uh, heavy, dense fuels, whether it be non-native or native vegetation? All of that is incompatible. But as part of our right-of-way stewardship program, what we're trying to do is address those incompatible species, whether they be native or non-native. But if we see that there is a, uh, uh, an issue with potential introduction and spread of non-native invasives, we typically will partner with the landowner to help address that. Great, I think that answers Tara's question, which does go on, but I think that that covers the, the specifics that she had about that. Um, um, Nicole asks, have you considered a test plot with supplemental plantings of natives? Yes, uh, I didn't include the slides on that in the American River Parkway because of uh, the, the time restraints. We actually did what we called our pollinator test plot and right in that same right of way we did extensive management. Uh, in a small plot, we, we were calling it our kind of pollinator demonstration garden, and we collected native seed from the American River Parkway, a local nursery, um, germinated that, and gave us plugs and plantings to use. Now the site was, ex you know, excessively overgrown with yellow star thistle, poison hemlock, and other, and so we first had to try to knock that invasive plant uh, population down, and we did that through mowing, selective herbicide, tilling, and then actually planting of native plants. Um, and we, we did that uh, a couple times because of the intense pressure of the non-native and non-native invasives. But we did actually get some pretty good establishment of native flowers. Um, and what we found is, is that in that small area, uh, both, if I recall correctly, both the native bees and honeybees used that site more so than the other two uh, landscapes. Now that was on a 50, maybe by 50 foot plot. Um, typically that sort of intensive management across hundreds and hundreds and potentially thousands of miles of electric transmission corridor is just not feasible uh, for a utility. But there are cases where we have worked uh, with either public land managers or other um, conserved lands, and we've done some limited planting. Um, and, and it has showed some success. But the cost and the amount of uh, intense inputs that you have to do is really restrictive from a broad landscape perspective. I've got a follow-up question from Scott that you may have covered in that answer, Peter. Um, he asks if you've done any seeding on the rights of way. We have, um, we've tried seeding in the American River Parkway, but the seed banks for the yellow star thistle, poison hemlock and mustard just outcompetes it. Where we have had success is uh, in some case during fires, um, our local fire agencies will ask us to uh, use the right of way as a place to 
uh, slow a fire or fight a fire from and backfire from it. And there's been requests for us to cut everything down in the right of way. Potentially, they might run a, a tractor down it to try to create a fire break. And in those cases, when there's been significant disturbance to the soil, uh, we have done replanting. Uh, but that's after a fire, you know, in the, in the, in the midst of a crisis. Um, it's not how we want to typically manage by just, you know, com completely blading or masticating everything. Our, again, our preference is to use this integrated approach, um, you know, manual, mechanical, and chemical. Um, coincidentally, the next question is about fire as well. Any data on use of prescribed fire under power lines or over natural gas or petroleum lines? Sounds dangerous. Main concerns I have are safety, but also wonder about pollinators. So some of you may have heard of some of the, catas the catastrophic fires in California uh, in Sonoma County. Um, and we had actually established our test plots on Pepperwood Preserve where we were going to start observing manual and mechanical only compared to manual, mechanical, and chemical. And unfortunately, much of Pepperwood Preserve burned up. So that's going to be an interesting site for us to now look at, um, you know, what starts to regrow and how our management techniques, you know, what, what, will, what will the plant communities look like over time? We're hoping to have long-term uh, uh, research going on there. And so with, with fire, that's going to be very interesting to see what happens. Uh, prescribed burning over gas pipelines. Um, I, I don't know much about that. My sense is, is that it's uh, potentially safe, um, but I think they would want to do uh, probably some leak test surveys ahead of time. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know about burning over gas pipelines. Burning under electric transmission lines is also not uh, ideal in that the smoke, if it's thick enough, the particulate matter can cause uh, the lines to trip. You can get phase-to-phase -phase arcing and uh, relays on the line, or in some cases you can actually get phase to ground arcing. So when we use prescribed burns around our transmission lines, we're, we're typically keeping it 100 feet or more away. Uh, and then we're using other techniques that um, would mimic uh, reducing the amount of plant cover that might not be compatible. We're just gonna roll right through a couple more here since we still have quite a few people on the line. Um, Donnie asks, how often are you having to retreat a right away? It, you know, it really depends. And, and again, the whole concept between uh, about integrated veg management is you're doing a site specific evaluation. And so with changing landscapes, different uh, environments, microclimates, um, along with, uh, you know, seasonal changes from year to year, uh, it can depend. So, uh, you know, ideally, you, 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 you do the heavy work in one year, you do the reclamation, um, you follow up uh, within one or two years later and look at potentially hand cutting and, and, or, and or selectively using herbicides uh, to treat in year uh, two or three. Uh, and then depending on the location, you may come out, you know, three to five years. It really depends. Now, if we're working to partner to address invasive plants, then that might require us to do more frequent visits. And, and in fact, a, uh, in, in many cases, many of the invasive forbs that we're dealing with, we want to treat in the early, uh, early spring, early summer, uh, spring and summer. Um, and what we find is that some of the other woody vegetation that we need to control you get better control if you're working in the summer to early fall. So in some cases, we may visit uh, twice, uh, do a noxious weed invasive plant uh, uh, sweep uh, spring, summer, and then follow up uh, in, in the late summer and fall. But if, you know, if all, it, under an ideal condition, it'd be great to go one year, three years, five years, seven years. And over time, what's happening is, is you're using less and less herbicides, you're using less and less chainsaws, which, you know, spit oil, um, less and less need to bring in heavy equipment. And that's, the, that's the, the great thing about an IVM. If you can get that stable native plant community, 
it helps restrict the regrowth of those incompatibles and over time your inputs decrease. Okay, a couple more. Peter, if you're game, I thought we could do just a couple more questions. How's that? Sure. Okay. Um, Chris uh, only asks, was PG&E able to get any grants to hire IVM partners or other contractors to do some of this work, or did the utility company cover the whole cost? So we don't, we haven't uh, worked directly with uh, Rick Johnstone and IVM partners. Um, what we, we've got, um, what we primarily do and we manage this work is we hire licensed pesticide control advisors and registered professional foresters to set up and manage the work. And then we use tree contractors and spray contractors to perform the work. And then so far our research partners, you know, like what IVM partners do, does has been the pollinator partnership and Sonoma State University. And with this recent grant funding, Sonoma State University is also reaching out to UC Davis, Sacramento State to see if they'd like to be involved uh, since the Eldorado Forest location is up in the Sierra Nevada and Sonoma State's almost out of the coast. Um, but we have other environmental consultants that we work with, um, but, I, that, but I'm not aware of us specifically hiring Rick at IBM Partners. Um, I've got two related questions, one from Chris and one from Sean, about um, sort of how you get permission to do changes. So Sean says, how did you get buy-in from private landowners to allow for a change in management of the rights of way? And Chris says, did you need any approvals from landowners along the right of way, which are basically the same. They're similar questions. Okay. So uh, most of our facilities are on easements and those easements, since many of these facilities were, were built in the forties and fifties and beyond is we actually have a land right that is associated with that uh, easement. And typically those land rights allow us um, to be able to cut, trim, and remove any sort of vegetation that we feel poses a risk to our facilities. And so it's all about reaching out and educating them and working with them to understand why this work is critical, uh, why it's important to keep the lights on and the power flowing, why it's important to reduce the risk of, of a fire and fuels and what, the, what damage it can do. Um, and so it, it's about educating them and working with them. Ultimately, if, if they refuse to allow us to do the work, then typically those land rights give us the right to do it. Now that's for cutting and removing, but uh, we don't necessarily have any right to use herbicides on a, on a private property unless that there's granted permission. And so that's another opportunity where we try to educate uh, and help them understand why there's multiple benefits of using that. If we, if we just continue to cut and cut and cut, it typically regrows and it regrows with a greater stem density. So that means we're back on your property the next year and the next year and maybe two years later. But if we can establish this low growing plant community, then we don't necessarily have to be in your backyard as many times. Sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. So typically we have got the right to cut and remove and we need to get permission to use herbicides on private property and, and public lands too. Awesome. Um, Betsy left an interesting comment that some of you might want to take a look at that is not a question, but she comments that higher diversity and abundance is not always the gold standard of evaluating the quality of a site. I think that's an entirely other conversation. Um, I love it though. And I think that we're going, we're going to, I'm going to come right back online here, Peter, and uh, Just start a real, you out. I was going to say a real quick comment, a real quick oh, comment yeah. on that. Um, the Electric Power Research Institute is actually doing some work now and yeah they're trying to better understand what are, what should be the what should be the metrics what 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 are the important things that we should be looking at and i know that the pollinator partnership is looking at that too so i appreciate the comment and just wanted to point out that you know epri may be involved with looking at some of that 
Um, and we're going to wrap it up because of what we've kind of uh, gone over time. I want to thank everybody. I want to thank Peter. I want to thank David. I want to thank the U.S. Forest Service, and I want to thank all of you guys for being online today. Such fascinating questions. Every time we do one of these webinars, we seem to get more and more amazing questions. The conversation is great. I want to mention for members, we do have a listserv um, in our new member site uh, for pollinators. Uh, it's just getting started, but it might be a good place to move the conversation if some of you are members of the NAA. That's it. Thank you so much, everybody. We really love it. I will try to get this archive up as soon as humanly possible. And we will see you in two weeks at, um, at the next one. Thanks very much. Have a great day.